one of the three parallel sessions. This one is the one called Red Plus Money for Green Results. What Red Finance uh, needs to succeed. I'm Christopher Martius. Uh, I work for C4. I'm the team leader for climate change in C4, based in uh, Indonesia. And I'm going to be the moderator of this session. And we have five panelists. And um, I'm going to introduce them in, in a moment. And um, I would like to first uh, congratulate you to be in this session because it shows you are no cynics. I read uh, last week in Economist that Oscar Wilde said, a cynic is somebody who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, so you are no cynics because you know at least the value. There is a value to forests. Maybe you don't know the value, but you know that there is one. And I think nobody knows the price. So it's a bit the other way around. I think it's probably also a citation that everybody in finance has heard a hundred times. But um, I found it still quite uh, useful to opening uh, this, this session, uh, which comes out, or which was born out of a study which we have been doing together with uh, colleagues in Kowi, Aska here, who is going to be the first speaker, and also the, the Öko Institute in Germany on Red Plus Finance, and that's going to be the first presentation. And then we're going to have a second presentation by Eli Barudi from the World Bank on what the World Bank does, and then we have three panelists uh, commenting on that. And uh, I also, I'm also going to open the floor later for questions. And if you don't want to go, get up and get to the microphone, you can also use the Slido uh, tool that uh, the GLF has made available online through your cell phone, send us some questions. Just, I just need to figure out how to see them later, but uh, I think we can probably find that solution. So, um, the, the panel is composed of five people. Uh, we start with Aska, as I said, Aska Orlison. He is the global leader on land use and bioeconomy in, at Kowi, which is a consultancy company in Denmark. Uh, followed by Eli, Eli Sabarudi, who was the leader for ca on carbon, carbon finance uh, at the World Bank. And then we're going to have uh, Gabriel Labatte, who is a, a senior program officer at UN Red, based in Panama. And the next uh, panelist is Kaspar Wansleben, who is a managing director for forest and uh, climate for the Forest and Climate Change Fund. And these all very complicated names, so. Excuse me if I'm reading this off. And then we have Dasono Hatono, who is president director at PT Rimba Makmo Utama in Jakarta. He's based in Jakarta. Um, so, I'm trying to see if I forgot something to say. Yeah, I was asked to have a low number of people, or panelists were asked to have a low number of PowerPoint slides. Uh, because the emphasis should be on debate. We still think that a few slides are sometimes useful to convey some information uh, and to have a discussion that is not totally based in, in space, but maybe based on some data and evidence. So we're going to start now with the two presentations and then get into the discussion later. So I'd like to ask uh, Asker now to take the floor and give us his talk. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak here. Uh, as I said, my name is Asko Olesen, and uh, I'm from Kovi in Denmark. And uh, I'm going to immediately comply with the outcome of the morning session in that I'm going to do something very boring. Uh, but before you then start leaving the room, because it, it will be a lot of numbers and tables and so on and so forth, then rest assured that Towards the end, I will be doing something slightly less boring in that I will deceive my own role and step out of it and come up with a, a couple of observations on where red are going uh, based on advising governments over the last 10 years on exactly climate change and land use. Um, so just briefly before we go, go into it, the boring part is four tableaus. 
Thought to close that report on a study we did for the European Commission, C4, Covi, and Öko Institute, uh, on mapping global red finance. And that was uh, initially screening 109 countries, then scaling that down to 41 countries on the recipient side, and uh, 10 donors on the, on the donor side, and mapping all the flows of red and related finance between those countries. The report is not out yet. Uh, it will be out over the summer, so you can check the, the GT Klima homepage of Europe, European Commission, and you will find a lot of information, a lot of tableaus, a lot of tables in there that you can, that are useful for more detailed analysis if, if that's of interest. Uh, but when we've completed those four tableaus, and I'm going to go through them pretty fast, then uh, I'm going to come up with the usual advisor observations, uh, which are compliant and in line with what uh, governments want to hear. Uh, but then I'm going to finish off with some uh, less usual observations on where uh, red could be going, in particular taking into consideration uh, the red, uh, the private uh, finance space. Um, there are many of these not so uh, presentation friendly uh, tables in the report. This reports on 41 countries and their capacity uh, to realize their climate change mitigation potential uh, related to land use. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of algorithms behind it. It's Hannes Butcher at the Uco Institute who did it. Uh, and it merely shows that some countries uh, like Malaysia using this uh, algorithm or the algorithms we developed uh, is very, very likely to realize their potential if they have the funding provided they have the funding. Whereas there are very other uh, potential, uh, potential profiles of many of the other countries covered. Um, you could draw a lot of points from this uh, and you would see that there are some countries that score very low on, let's say, governance and there are other countries that score high or low on MRV capacities and so on and so forth. So if you were a program director or program planner at a donor agency somewhere, you could sit down on this and say, okay, we need to probably design a program that can target this in this country or region. Now, there is a similar uh, level of disaggregation on, on information in the report on the money that flowed. The former table was merely showing uh, the capacity to deal with the money, not if, whether the money went there. Uh, but uh, this table shows at regional level where the money flowed in terms of the same uh, themes. Um, and I couldn't possibly include in a presentation uh, all the countries you can see in the report. It should be said that all information comes from the OECD DAC database. So we've been working with that for one and a half year. Uh, and scrutinizing in, in every detail. Um, and I'm going to draw some conclusions from this later on. Um, also, we looked at uh, the thematic uh, distribution on the donor side. What, for, for what purposes did they allocate their funding? Uh, and this picture came out uh, on the main major donors that covers, I think, 70 or 80 percent of the total red allocation for the period uh, 28 to 2015. Uh, and you see there are different types of donors. Uh, if you take from a thematic point of view, uh, some focused on governance. There are others uh, like the EU institutions and Japan, for example, to some extent UK, where, whereas there are other profiles with a more mixed picture on some that has focused a lot on addressing drivers and risks. The specific uh, definitions of what drivers and risks in these other categories are uh, is also to be found in found in the report. Now, obviously we were, the, the ask on the side of the uh, commission for this study was also to cover private finance, which is to some extent from a mapping point of view, very much uncharted territory. Uh, so we are starting from scratch and going through a lot of publications and trying to apply the same definitions of, of uh, red finance as done for the donor side. Uh, and what we came up with was this table, uh, where one of the few points you can take from it is that the total private finance in direct red, and that is investments that have the uh, red plus in their name, uh, is next to nothing compared to the total donor finance. Whereas if we go into indirect red, which is for the purpose of this study uh, defined as uh, investments or, or donor funding that uh, serves 
some or all of the same objectives as red, but does not explicitly lend itself to red, uh, then you'll see also that the private finance and, and, uh, and the donor finance is more balanced in, in size, but there is huge uncertainty around these numbers. They're based on, on uh, great literature and, and a lot of uh, reports. But including for the purpose of perspective, uh, an assessment done by Ivo Mulder of the UNEP uh, Finance Initiative, you immediately see that the scale of finance, uh, the public finance, the, the dedicated red finance, relative to what is soft commodity finance, what we call soft commodity finance, that is finance into soft commodity production in the same countries, is a completely different scale. Now, the obvious or traditional uh, observations that we would then convey to the, the readers of the report would then be, of course, you would say something on results. There's a couple of top performers that does well. They have a huge potential. Uh, you would also say that we have uh, that there are some themes that are reasonably well uh, financed so far, looking across all those countries. Uh, possibly MRV is not that well financed, and at a geographical scale you would see that uh, we find that Africa seems to get relatively less, or has got relatively less finance uh, compared to the, the other regions. Uh, and also, we would, of course, convey the message uh, to the decision makers uh, when doing such a study that private finance dwarfs red plus public finance by an order of magnitude. Um, so, if we were lucky in the best case scenario, then the outcome would be that someone in the government offices uh, around the world, or the donor sides at least, would say, okay, we, perhaps we should coordinate better, we should send, uh, make sure that we uh, cover the, the full palette of, of issues and maybe we can work together. And countries that are good at one thing, MRV, would probably go and export that knowledge more than others. And I'm Danish, coming from a country where we govern just about anything and we measure just about anything. We should probably then lend ourselves to going out and, and show how we can do MRV and, and uh, provide better data, instead of trying to do something that we don't have a tradition for. Just an observation. Then also you would probably see a reorientation if they were to comply with this study so that there would be flowing more funds into uh, to Africa in, in, in the years to come. And the obvious point also, blended finance, let's do more of it. It comes from, from this perspective. So, uh, my presentation could end here, in which case I would have uh, very diligently reported on the study that we did. But it's not so easy because Having worked as a government advisor in the European Commission with the Danish go donors and also as an, now as a consultant for 10 years, um, I'd say it's not about climate finance. The decisions we want to have uh, taken on Red Plus, taking Red Plus forward, is not about Red Plus and it's not about climate finance. Because if you imagine yourself or imagine a hardworking but fairly troubled Ministry of Environment, let's just assume it's him, it could be Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Development Corporation instead, uh, then he would have a whole range of other issues that he would have to uh, pay attention to and dedicate funds for. Plastic uh, pollution, air pollution, nitrate leaching and in his home country, perhaps he has a decrease in budget, you will see that in the EU after Brexit, for example. Uh, and then you would have a whole range of other issues that have nothing to do with red or indeed climate finance that he would have to comply with when he was designing any sort of action or committing himself to, to pay out money to support red. It would be, of course, you would have to be complementary with what you're doing already. There's some sort of conservatism in, in government spending. Uh, you would have to respect the WGO rules. That is quite something if you're working in, in the trade sphere. Uh, you would have to make softer measures, you would have to always create jobs and support SMEs. That's simply just, you can't do anything in a government without having that included somewhere in your motivation. Uh, and you would of course have to respect whatever has been done previously, and you would also have to make it, uh, let's say, measurable and fit into a three-year government program that could report some tangible results back that he could use for his next election. That does not fit well with RED, does it? Uh, in fact, we had a study just uh, last year where we were asked to come up with ideas on how to address deforestation globally, but we were to deliver a pragmatic, compromise-driven approach with optimal impact for very little budget and hardly any risk. Please. I'd like to see someone come up with a solution to deforestation that complies with that. The scope 
and the level of ambition and the political capital to be invested in red, I'm sorry to say, is simply not there. So, expect no solution from policymakers. That's the short message. And be aware, I'm trying to spark a discussion afterwards. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll not be able to halt deforestation using red alone. But red is a part of the solution, of course. It will be, for the next many years, an ongoing negotiation with power holders and continued state of insufficient public funding and resources for this purpose. It's just the way it is. We're not going to wake up a day and all, all of us in this room will look each other into the eyes and say, ah, we, are, we found panacea. Uh, now we have the situation where Redis Fund is fully funded, is all working, we have addressed deforestation. No, because deforestation is a wicked, wicked problem and I don't see it being solved by any specific date. Um, so what do we do then? Well, uh, as someone said in one of the other, uh, in, the, um, in the bond session earlier on which I joined, I think it was uh, Howard uh, Jana Shapiro who said, it's not a theory of change, it's a change of theory we have to talk about here. So let's just get it clear. Climate finance decision making is merely a small part of the puzzle. If we continue to frame red as part of the COP negotiation for many years, it will not address the problem. Red is only one stream of money, alongside a lot of other streams of money, going into, let's say, uh, deforestation areas. There's a lot of, area, a lot of actors involved, uh, uh, producers, uh, traders, uh, producers of com uh, com uh, products later on, uh, consumers, investors, donor governments and all these. And we have to have the full picture and we have to address deforestation uh, with all these actors. Uh, and that's me asking needs. And there is no solution if we all come up with requirements and needs. So we need to go a step further than that. The donor government is, well, I'm not trying to, uh, to make their case easier, but it's not, it's not easy to be a donor government uh, if you're democratically elected to solve this issue. Um, so, what does red finance need to succeed? Well, my view, based on the work I've been doing for some years, the unusual expert observations is, there is plenty of finance out there. So, we should not continue to try to push for an increase of 1 or 2% of the government budget to go for red plus money. That's not going to make the change. What's going to make the change is to have the private finance being involved and the government helping that. So instead of continuing to try to devise development cooperation projects uh, that uh, are uh, defined by narrow year uh, frameworks, uh, have to comply with public decision-making processes and be developed within uh, country-centric uh, finance envelopes, I th it's not efficient. Uh, instead, there's one recommended response, what I would say would be to Let's, uh, of course, go from change of uh, theory of change to change of theory, but also public-private partnership programs on red. You have to not only blend finance, also blend action. Blend the project from the beginning. And I'd like to see, and, and even in Denmark, where we cooperate on everything and try to be so correct, we don't do this. You don't have a, uh, let's say, a, a full deforestation strategy where you, together with the companies that rely on imported forestry commodities, together with development corporations, together with NGOs, define uh, an, a strategy that includes trade, that includes consumption action on your own citizens, which is never going to happen from a political point of view, um, which includes retail, which includes food sector, which includes investors. We have to address the full circle, the, all the drivers, all the actors in one. And red is just one component of that. And that's the component that can reward climate action. There's a lot of other actions that need to be rewarded as well. Um, so perhaps public money would be better spent preparing and de-risking private investments instead of having to develop projects themselves. I hope to spark some comments shortly. So last slide. Um, dare to test 70% solutions because we'll never wake up in a scenario where we have red fully defined, we have a completely un complete understanding of the wicked problem, uh, and we can just go out and, and implement. 
start doing things even if we don't know exactly what we want to do. Think, and here I'm, I'm again building on what was said earlier today, think Red Plus inside the landscape box as a complementary instrument, not a measure, not a policy in itself, a complementary instrument uh, next to conservation finance and a lot of other strategies. Make pro uh, projects investable for private sector. Make sure that if they put money into a project, there's a tangible outcome they can use. And that's easier said than done. Uh, but it could be, for example, to work on what was called green jurisdictions in, in one of the earlier sessions today. Make sure that there are safe heavens, safe places, safe regions where you can source certain uh, commodities from, where uh, companies, uh, local governments, and, and and donor governments work together to make sure that this area, at least some a place where you can have verified sourcing, or at least safe sourcing, uh, uh, so that it's easier for, for companies to do good. Strengthen MRV to build data so that companies that want to uh, showcase and want to, uh, to prove that they're doing good have uh, um, trustworthy data to build on instead of having to develop, a, let's say, a red baseline on their own. It's not going to happen. And then, of course, uh, one of my pet issues, create demand for verified mitigation outcomes. Um, I was the first sovereign project manager ever when I was in the Danish government that bought uh, forest credits for a government program, uh, for government uh, climate change mitigation back in 2009. That was New Zealand uh, removal units. It was quite controversial back then. But as far as I know, there's been very little government uh, buy-in to verified mitigation outcomes from any of these projects since then. Create that demand, else it won't start working. Yes, um, that was it. A little more slides than allowed, but I tried to speed up. Um, and I'd be happy if there was a lot of questions, also critical ones, later on. Chris. Thank you very much. Yes, we go directly into the next presentation, and then we have, please keep your questions live for later. Um, the floor is with Ellie now. Stand here to this yeah, okay. speak from here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eddie Barudi. I'm the coordinator in the World Bank for the two land use carbon funds, the Biocarbon Fund and the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. So, Aska, we've been the guys trying to put Red Plus into operation with this donor finance. So, I'm going to speak a little bit about the finance that we do have, how we've used it, and where we are in the timing, and what I think in terms of Red Finance will happen going forward. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these numbers, I'm sure you know them, but for uh, the bottom uh, bullet on this is what is driving us at the World Bank to think through what we can do more of because we know that the work that we're doing in uh, f that deforestation, land degradation, poor environment is really driving a, bi a big chunk of the climate problem and yet there's only 3% of the funding that is going into this area uh, to, to help. Um, it's an important issue for the bank. Uh, not only does climate, does this degradation impact climate, it impacts poverty. And so from this perspective, we're very keen that we can make inroads into this. And we've got a number of instruments at the bank that can help, but what I'm going to focus on are two the carbon instruments, the Biocarbon Fund and the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. They add up to uh, just over $1.5 billion collectively. And we basically have funding that is in two pots, and I'm going to keep coming back to these buckets. We have a significant amount of funding that we use for technical assistance and the enabling environment. I want to come back to this because all morning we've been hearing about land tenure problems. What is, what is, how can you de-risk what Asker was saying? So on average, we've got around over 40 countries that receive this funding. It's for national readiness work, but it is really working to put in place more solid foundations that can help de-risk and bring in private sector or other finance. What we don't have is the piece in the middle, the investment funding that our funds sit on. Obviously, our institution does bring that piece to the table, but we are also 
really hoping to work with other funds that are in investments and that can help us to come to scale. And I will highlight this through a ex country example that we have as well that I will come back to. And finally, the majority of our funding, we have about a billion dollars for this, is really to pay for results that relate to climate and climate results. And so this is where we are, the direction we'd like to move in and where climate finance uh, will be deployed for results-based finance, specifically for emission reductions and tons of CO2. Now, what we expect to see over time is different finance at different stages, and you would hope that countries can access technical assistance up front. What you hope to see in the blue there is investments that are not leading to anything healthy or happy go down, and then investments for sustainable land use in orange go up. And then alongside that, climate investment working alongside other investment funding, which can also then trigger the results-based finance. And so I think this is very important because sometimes when we're working with countries, the timing issue is, is critical, and the investments upstream and upfront have been very important and I will highlight this um, shortly. I'm not going to dwell on this. You didn't want too, much slide, too many slides, but basically 22 countries, 24 large-scale jurisdictions where we're putting the red funding into practice to go to results-based payments with the majority in the technical assistance. I want to highlight one country, which is Mozambique, which is one of the countries in our portfolio. Mozambique has received... Um, a fair bit of funding. Um, they have worked, we have been working very much with the government to develop the National Sustainable Development Project with them. You can see that this is a program that is very cross-cutting. So energy, water, training technology, market linkages and financing, and a lot obviously on environment and rural development. The majority of the population of Mozambique is well below the poverty line, hugely dependent on agriculture and rural development for any kind of, of growth. The funding that we brought to the table has instigated basically very two large-scale programs, the Zambezia landscape and the Cabo Delgado landscape. So you can see we're talking about 6 million hectares and 4 million hectares of area that we are targeting to work on. I mean, I think sometimes it's hard to imagine the scales, and I think the scale also frightens the private sector in terms of how we discuss red jurisdictions, and I'm happy to come back to that point if it helps. Um, the programs that we are developing are all of this scale. So, for example, the program in Ethiopia is the size of Italy. The program in Colombia is the size of Poland, because I know sometimes it's not hard for, it's sometimes hard for us to imagine the scales. But they're not easy, and these kinds of funding are low for that kind of scale. So you really want to be able to set something up that can attract finance in. So Mozambique, um, an example here. When I hear that Red Plus has been slow, I always have to think, you know, yes, it can be perceived as that for people that don't really know the nitty gritty. Because when you look at what countries are doing to change the business as usual for large scale deforestation that's happening, they are making major changes. So Mozambique received from the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility initially $3.6 million to attempt to put in place an enabling environment. And we then added $5 million to that pot to help because what was being undertaken by Mozambique was significant. Forest sector reform, for example, looking at moratoriums on new concessions, but reviewing existing concessions, trying to put in place a, for a national forest inventory, you know, understanding what's happening in the country, getting the data that you need to work with it. Mozambique actually merged a couple of ministries to make a difference, and they brought together the different uh, competing ministries in a way under one umbrella. There has been a lot of fundamental investment in this country to make the change. And this is what Red Readiness funding has done. And I think this helps to de-risk. Um, so this is the big ticket items, but basically with the funding that is technical assistance, there's a whole bunch of work on MRV. We've done the monitoring, uh, reporting, verification systems with countries from a very selfish selfish perspective. If we pay for carbon, we need to know what we pay for. We are now understanding that those MRV systems can be used for helping the private sector track and trace what they're doing in the jurisdictions we are paid for already. But a lot of people, you know, so a lot of this information needs to be out there for that understanding. Given it's World Bank, you can't escape safeguards. 
Working on environmental and social issues is critical for us, no harm done, making sure there is that inclusion. That's been a big part of these investments as well. These are just some examples. Any program going forward also has to be very open on the land tenure situation. There will be assessments and there has to be an assessment of how that gets tackled. So there is an openness of this information and I think to me this is what sets the solid foundation for the investments that will come in. And we're seeing that in Mozambique. So for example, this might not be a very easy slide to see, but the bottom line is the different color uh, rows are the funding that's come in, with the bottom being so the start of the technical assistance from climate finance that has come in. But what's happening in the middle is that there has been an amount of money leveraged for investments because of the start of this work program that came into place. So $50 million leveraged. It's been leveraged from World Bank investment parts. It's been leveraged from uh, the Global Environment Facility. It's been leveraged from other donor trust funds. It's also you heard this morning about um, Portacel, who is a private sector company working in the region, and we're looking for more of those private sector engagements. There will be, at the end of that uh, effort, hopefully a results-based payment pot, which should be an additional uh, $50 million, but that is uh, obviously once those investments are done, once the results are measured and can be verified, they'll be paid for. And this is just an example of the different mosaic of funding that these programs um, are attracting. So I just want to say that when I think of red finance and, and is red going to trees, it's going to a lot that is fundamental to keeping trees standing and to getting trees getting the healthier environments that do include those trees. So just from the portfolio that we have alone, uh, that we have within the FCPF and the BioCF, we're seeing partnerships with a whole ton of other um, investors. Um, I list them here. I'm not going to talk too much about them. I want to acknowledge partly because of our discussant, our UN Red partnership as well. Um, we have worked very much in the technical um, upstream work with a number of partners that includes UN Red, includes Profor. We are very much now moving into a phase where we're looking for partnerships for investments because those solid foundations are, are done in a number of countries. One encouraging thing that I see in our portfolio. Countries themselves are putting their own skin in the game. Uh, when we had this, uh, when we started this, there was a lot of discussion, where is the country budget? Uh, Vietnam is one country, for example, that came to the carbon fund portfolio, totally funding its work for emission reductions through its own uh, budget. Um, I want to say something on uh, uh, picking up on some of Esco's work. Um, the ministries of finance need to start engaging more. I mean, this dialogue has happened a lot with ministries of environment. I think we are starting to see that shift. I think there is a realization as environment see what's happening and the minister can uh, portray more about the importance of this, even from a financial perspective, what this is attracting to the country in finance. It starts to get that discussion going. But I don't want to only focus on the public. There is also interesting shifts in our portfolio on the private sector side. Now, I, I highlight here really very, I mean, it's it's very generalized slide because there's only so much you can put on a slide. But I've tried to think of what has really been our experience of hindering the private sector from coming in. Having a number of years of technical assistance private sector couldn't see how to engage with that. And I don't think that's surprising. I think the country needed the time to do what it needed to do in sort of getting itself sorted out and putting in place a foundation. As countries move on from this phase, they're drawing up what for them is the next steps, where their investments are going to be made that will trigger the results-based finance. That's where private sector can start to see what the plans are, the designs are, how they could potentially come into this. Another thing we see is the jurisdictional approach also is concerning in terms of the risk that the private sector will adopt. And we haven't been very good, to be honest, at explaining collectively, neither uh, multilaterals like ourselves or the countries we work with, on how to have these partnerships with the private sector. The private sector, in most cases, want a very defined, will work in a very defined uh, area, and we are actually accounting in much larger areas. So if there is an interest in carbon or how climate finance can interrelate, that becomes something a bit concerning to private sectors. So we have been working very hard 
in some of our programs, and we now have ways that we have through the uh, baselines and through some of the monitoring to figure out how we make this happen, because we really value that public and private partnership, and we need to make more of those happen. So um, the, the final point there is gaps. We realize that we've been very bad at informing what we do. So there are these jurisdictions, there's all this investment that's been made. How can you work to help um, others come along with you, but not using your jargon? I mean, the red world has been its own worst enemy on this. So I think there's been a bit, big mismatch in communication. Um, and that's something as well we're working on uh, changing. And I saw Joanna earlier, but she's gone. But we also have people working with us on this. And then I, the, the other shifts that we're seeing in the portfolio, and I, I want to say we've had the first private partnership in Ethiopia with Nespresso coming in, uh, but we are looking at others. So we are in discussion. We're seeing movement maybe, mainly in the agribusiness sector, but I think there are, should be opportunities in energy and in others. So looking at the sustainable commodities, cocoa, rubber, et cetera, in a number of our programs. So we're hoping that does come into fruition. I think the work in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire on cocoa is probably the most advanced in, in where we will end up with those private, with those partnerships as well. The synergies, um, I mentioned already that we're starting to understand more what we have as a base and what's been invested in in countries is useful to the private sector from their own angles. So looking at how we can modify that to, to bring it to fruition. And finally, on the financial side, I mean, we talk about the agribusiness and private sector, but I think now that we're seeing um, more um, what the investment plans are and what the program designs are, it's easier to also start understanding how you can get different kinds of financial financial engineering happening and could you attract funding from other sources. So there's a lot of discussions about bonds, we heard that today earlier, but we also think there could be a way of leveraging the finance that exists in these uh, programs to do more um, along those lines. And one thing we'd like to do, given that we're working in jurisdictions, is use the administrative frameworks to think through, can we incentivize through financial means and regulations ways to do more um, with private sector and to just uh, make it more interesting uh, to come in? So in closing, I would say that I think uh, from where we sit, we see that there is no uh, one size fits all, and it's not going to be either public or private. I think the scale of the issue is huge, and I think it has to be a combined, but also coordinated uh, way. And this is where we do find there is more room to do better. Uh, but for us, I've, it's not just about the emission reductions programs, but it's really about the poverty and, the, and its greener growth. So I feel we are in a better space, uh, given where we are with country programs maturing, that there are these opportunities, and I'm sure we will see them uh, come to fruition going forward. We know that just from our own uh, portfolio. But um, I think I would be very worried if halfway through we were changing theory um, or dump the theory of change equally. I think these uh, programs do take time. Making fundamental changes in institutions, in bringing along people, in uh, addressing concerns of livelihoods aren't things that can change overnight. So we really need to be there and be supportive and, and collectively work together. If we do succeed, we'll succeed because we are more intersectoral. Um, we have better interministerial collaboration and the inclusion stays in what we're doing. So on that note, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are, but uh, we are also succeeding because we are learning. I mean, we are changing theories in a stepwise way, not throwing them out, uh, like some suggest, red is dead and so on. And then uh, you start, you want to start something, or people suggest to start something totally new, like it was a big silver bullet. And then you, you end up being probably in the same space five years later, where things are complicated and, and require a lot of uh, adaptation and adoption of new ideas. Anyway time for our discussants to comment from your point of view. What, who, who would like to start? Gabriel? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I, was, I was watching the, the, the presentations and the uh,
okay. And uh, I kept thinking, uh, the title of the of uh, of this topic was, um, you know, what we need to do to to make Red Plus to succeed. So I was I was thinking, um, is it failing? Um, and uh, and then I went back. I I was trying to remember, but. As of last month, uh, the Lima Hub, the Lima Hub is this uh, platform where countries can report avoided deforestation after they comply with the UNFCCC uh, requirements, um, was giving a total of about six uh, gigatons. Uh, no, okay. Um, is that a, uh, is that good? I mean, is 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 that too little? Um, and uh, I think that is quite remarkable if you if you take into account uh, the whole landscape in which uh, Red Plus operates. Um, for once, it is size. Um, we we did last year a study on Red Plus finance and uh, sustainable forest management finance. We got a bit different numbers. I mean, not significantly, but in terms of money disbursed on the ground, our figures was about, you know, give and take 10%, was about $400 million per year for Red Plus. Okay. Um, if you add to that uh, what you could define as sustainable forest management finance, you could add another $600 million. It is a billion dollar per year. Everything computed into that. Um, looks like uh, a decent number until you you take a look at what was, <coughs> I'm sorry, at what was um, on the other side of the fence. Um, in 2015, uh, the subsidies that uh, were going to the uh, oil industry, <coughs> sorry, I'm just coming out of, of the cold, um, the subsidies going to the uh, oil industry were about $5 trillion. Um, true, sometimes this these calculations have uh, some mistakes. Uh, you want to take half out of that? It is $2.5 trillion. Um, so, and that's only for the oil industry. You can also go to countries. And uh, I was quickly checking uh, our, our uh, star performers. Uh, and I found some numbers for Ecuador. Uh, Ecuador is really one of our stars in the Red Plus universe. And uh, it has received money. It, it got money from UN Red, from, from FCPF, from the German uh, cooperation. Now, uh, I think that is a, a $50 million uh, a, a grant from the GCF. Uh, you put do, uh, all that together, and, uh, and you take a look again at the other side of the fence, and it's small. Uh, the amount of, uh, of, of credit to agriculture in Ecuador is 219 times greater. Only the amount of money coming from, pub, from public finance, I mean government finance into the cattle uh, uh, sector is 26 times greater. So I go back to the six gigaton and I, and I think, well, it is remarkable that in this environment, we still get this type of results. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I, that I, was, I was also thinking when I was uh, uh, looking at the presentation was about price. Um, this conversation is about markets, price signals, uh, um, to a great extent, decentralized incentives and uh, the price of, uh, of a ton of carbon in Red Plus is about $5 a ton. And I was thinking, you know, a ton of carbon in Ecuador is the same ton of carbon than in Europe. It's just the same. Last week, the ton of carbon in the European carbon market was 16 euros a ton. So put that in dollar terms at 20%. 
uh, you know, you get almost $18 uh, the ton of carbon. So I was, I was thinking, you know, what would be this conversation if today um, the ton of carbon paid in Red Plus uh, would get close to $20 a ton? I mean, what kind of incentives we would send to countries and what kind of response we would get from them? This is not to say um, that uh, those paying now $5 a ton are being stingy. No, I think that um, one of the great contributions of, of Red Plus to the development community has been the idea that, that while, in, while in the long run, this sustainable development is, uh, or a scenario, you know, that a scenario has positive net present value, I mean, we don't doubt that. The transition from the current trajectory to this other one that will put us in 20, 25 years' time in this sustainable scenario, this transition is not cost-free. It carries costs. And the question is, who is going to pay for that? So I think that Red Plus made a great contribution because, you know, one of the indicators that you are getting old is that you can remember really back in time. And I remember the development paradigm of the, of, of the 90s, which was uh, this, um, this sustainable development should be achieved by countries themselves because it is, it is good for countries, so they should pay for them, yeah, for it. Let's change that, and I think that countries like, for example, Norway, which is one of our main financiers, have been pivotal in putting this forward. So I wouldn't like this to be confused. I mean, the $5 I think that, you know, there are some questions about it, but it is still a great contribution to this, uh, to this cause. And, that, and I want to, to close this, this comment, uh, this intervention with two comments. I think that there are many, many actions to, to, to improve the performance of Red Plus. We were mentioning that uh, we need to increase the demand for verified emission reductions. Well, definitely. I think that the more, the better. But there is enough at this moment. I mean, Norway has, has uh, invested a chunk of money into this in several countries and is still waiting for results. Our colleagues at the bank uh, for many years have put a a solid commitment on the table. If you do emission reductions, we will pay for them. Um, and yet, it has been difficult for countries to, to come up with this, uh, uh, to enter these deals. Um, so there is something more than just uh, 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 adding the potential pot uh, for countries to get. The other one that is very important for me, because I, I, I am lucky enough to, to, um, to be on the field very often. I, I am the team leader of the, of the Red Plus program at UN Environment. I take a look at different places. And it's this idea that uh, um, policymakers will not really bring much to this discussion. And I, and I would urge a bit of caution about that. First, because, again, the topic of this conversation is about making markets work. But markets do not work in a vacuum, uh, in an empty space. Markets work better in London than in uh, Congo, because the institutions in the UK are different than the institutions in the Congo. And uh, institutions, I mean, the strengths of institutions is in the end a political decision of a country to have or not to have. And political decisions are not made in the abstract, are made by the summation of policy makers, of policy alliances that you have in a country. Rare unavoided deforestation is, a, is really a dirty business. I mean, have a walk in Madre de Dios in Peru, have a walk in the Congo, or in Mozambique, and you will quickly realize that this is not renewable energy. Uh, this is not, I, mean, I think that 20 years ago, I made the wrong decision. I got into, into landscape. Uh, I should have been in, in energy. Uh, life would have been much easier. Um, 
So it is, it is a difficult business. And, uh, and in the end, really, a good chunk of the solution will be given by how much we work and steer the development of these political alliances and institutions in the places we work. Thanks, uh, Gabriel. Maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you, Christopher. I'm They're talking about you. I've, I'm just. Um, <laughs> let me stand up rather than sitting down just to stretch myself. But um, um, I just, you know, I'm I'm a private sectors doing Red Plus. So I want to share my experience. I think um, I'm Indonesian. I used to work with J.P. Morgan. So I'm a banker. So 10 years ago, I think exactly 2007 when Bali Cop happened, and uh, somebody threw me an idea of this acronym Red Plus. So I was like, what is Red Plus? I was doing mortgage underwriting, you name all these things that JP Morgan does. Um, but I think one thing that was still certain that I've learned 10 years ago and now is we have to value our environment. That's the value proposition. That's the theory of change that we are talking about. So naively, 10 years ago, I thought, wow, this is going to be easy. I mean, Andrew is, uh, you know, we, we talk about this for a long time. But I think what I can tell people right now is we are in the stage of what we call red plus fatigue. People are just getting tired, right? I mean, you know, we, in, in year 2007, people are excited about this. And then suddenly you start, you know, I, I, I started that endeavor. I, I was, you know, I was lucky enough to be in the project level, you know, running a project in Santa Kalimantan in the peatlands where you can underwrite a carbon so much, you know. I mean, as I, I, I was a real estate underwriter in, in, in JP Morgan. So when I look at the cash flow and potential, this is great. This is like a gold mine that we're striking in the, in the peatland in Santa Kalimantan. But in reality, if you look back 10 years, I would have said, I wish I shouldn't be doing this. Because it's, it's, it, it is it, it is a tough business, just like Gabriel said, it's a tough business. But I think it's because of what we make that business hard to ourselves. I'll give you an example. There's a huge expectation 10 years ago. But I think there's a lot of money being poured into the enabling condition while thinking that we need to enable everything first before we get things done. So what you're seeing that the past 10 years deforestation doesn't go down. It's like, you know, donors, um, World Bank, everybody is like looking, believe in that model of we need to help the government first put this. And the government, the recipient government, particularly Indonesia, think of this as just a typical donor funding, take our time, we don't have to do any negotiation. There's a lot of things going on while we, the action on the ground doesn't, you know, it it's, it's doesn't say what we're trying to achieve. But the good news about what I've been doing the past 10 years that I can show you on the project level, Red Plus changed the way private sector do business, particularly for myself. Because this is probably, you know, and as, as you know, we've been, humanity has been exploiting environment like, you know, like they think that it'll, it'll never end, it will just get benefit of all. But I think what more important is when, uh, you know, in a project level is we start seeing that community should be part of the equation. I mean, we are private sectors, but it's all about community. Well, I was thinking more of just the protection later on that, you know, after one year, two year, three years, I realized that there has to be production coming out from this landscape as well. Because the reality is nobody's paying the pro for protection, but somebody still have to eat. But it become actually a good combination as a private sector where you look into an area where you can, there, there are some Ecosystems are meant to be protected. There's some ecosystems are meant to produce. But only work together with that, then you actually can proceed. But the reality is three, four years down the line, people start shifting. It's not theory of change, it's change of theory. Where you start saying that donors start looking into supply chain. They don't, they don't talk about Red Plus anymore. It's like just disappeared. Let's just push this supply chain and push it to the private sectors that are doing all this agriculture. Then they will solve the Red Plus problem. But that's what we've been seeing the past three, four years. But the reality is you have to work together. It, it's just not about, you know, it's about private sectors that want to do conservation, adding private sector wants to do production, and work together to actually look at how we can manage our land use sector more efficiently on a global scale. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a lot of the you know, first things that I said. 
But the problem is, if you, I want to look back. If 10 years ago, what we can do better, just like, you know, Asker mentioned, maybe there should be a way that government start paying before the enabling condition done. Then you will, you will create private sectors like ourselves to be bigger and, you know, then you can learn this thing. But the reality is I think we got tied up into the model that it's about governance, it's about policy, but policy doesn't change what happened on the ground. It's not instantaneous like Indonesian government change, oh, we are going to do a moratorium, the next day is gone. No, it doesn't work that way. So this is a lesson that I think we have to go going forward. It's not just about, you know, the, the, the typical donor countries working together. It's a full collaboration between private sectors, you know, donors, civil society, even communities as it impacted what we are doing on the ground. So, um, but I want to, but I, I don't want to sound skeptic. You know, I think uh, one thing for sure, it's, this is a very, we are in the phase where the tipping point is coming. You start seeing people understanding carbon more than 10 years ago. I mean, the millennials know this. I mean, this is, this is for them. This is not for, for me. I'm, I'm not that old, but I think, you know. But if you look at the people, the consumers, the society, they start understanding that we should not be doing what we have been doing the past 200 years since industrialization, trashing the planet. So there is a way of the millennial thinking that we can convey our message to get this. It's, it's funny because... When I sit down with my friends' kids, they understand what I do. In Indonesia, I'm like a rare species, you know, and when all my, my colleagues are doing coal mining, some of them do renewable energy, but a lot of coal mining, oil and gas, palm oil. And here I am sitting down, oh, I'm trying to save the environment, and my friend said, good luck. And then my friend's kid said, uncle, that's a great idea, because that's where I think the money making going to be. So, you know, I think we are, we're in that verse of where, you know, we're sitting. I, I think we're very, I am still optimistic. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years, you know, and I think, but um, certain countries will have to be treated differently. Particularly Indonesia, or a lot of the big country, developing countries, there has to be a more efficient way of involving the private sectors. There has to be a transfer of real, you know, result base, rather than figure out the enabling condition, the governance, or because... The government are just become more skeptical. As you move into this model, they're like, eh, and then they're more for, you know, we have our palm oil just get higher and higher, we deforest more and more, and then to a point where it hits and it stops, hopefully. But I think um, in closing, I have to say that, yes, it's a partnership. I mean, we have to look at this. The development and conservation protection is, is, is the same coin with two different sides. You just have to look at it. How do you look at this? It's very important. But in the meantime, you have to, re you know, each country have to be strategic to see what the value they can bring. You know, I mean, there's so much, you know, there's a lot of efficiency. And I'm, I'm just like Ali mentioned, Indonesia, the Minister of Finance, really into it now. And this, we've been talking about the past 10 years of Minister of Environment, Forestry, talk about this. But now when the money starts spoken, usually people really are following. So I think... Uh, I mean, uh, in a, I want to close this with a very exciting time. I think the next five years we'll see, but, you know, that this thing is going to eventually scale up from our private sectors, you know, as well as the government. And uh, I think one point I want to say, jurisdiction. The real, a lot of the donors start thinking jurisdiction more of an administrative jurisdiction, which is causing the problem to begin with. In Indonesia particularly, you are talking about jurisdiction based on the district level, and next thing you know, a new politician come in town and they just change everything. So there has to be a way to think about jurisdiction in a more broader sense, whether ecosystem-based, whether it's subnational, because once you tie that jurisdiction into a particular leader, then you get the same problem again. So that's, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Kasper, you look skeptical. <laughs> well, I'm You're skeptical. Uh, well, not necessarily skeptical. I mean, this <laughs> sounded no, not cynical, but it. I mean, I'm I'm to close this opening round and spin a bit. Uh, does red work? Does red not work? How do we know yet? So I'm. Uh, I don't know. It's a, that's a tough. Uh, that's a tough question. What I will try to do is address a little bit of granular view from our perspective, and we are not a red plus fund. So we're a little bit outside of this world. Uh, we would be
according to your categorization, an indirect threat, threat prospect. What, uh, what we've been doing, and uh, we, come, we come from microfinance, we are uh, investors into a lot of developing countries, so we, we know those countries uh, well. We particularly have been increasingly concerned with the ongoing degradation of landscapes and rural areas <coughs> systems. And we started to look at that uh, more closely and um, started to look uh, very closely at the forest regions. Ongoing forest degradation and the ability of, of our forest landscape to naturally regenerate to naturally regenerate and, and, and the emergence of secondary forest. And this was the, the, the themes which interested us. How can, we, how can we create models which assist that process to happen? And I think we were quite open in the beginning to that. Um, I, I would like to just take five, maybe five points, five lessons learned. Uh, we've done uh, two investments, and so we, we have a particular view only in Central America, so there's a limitation to, to, to our world view, but I, I think these echo a lot of the things we've been, we've been hearing before. The first thing is on markets. When we started to fundraise for this initiative and we started to talk to investors, one thing became clear very quickly. Uh, with a red plus, with a carbon-based model, you couldn't fundraise, full stop. This market was not considered seriously, and it was not considered to be stable enough and predictable enough to give you the 15 years perspective you need to make something like this work. So this was the situation about two years ago when we, when we did this seriously. And I think we have to be honest about that. Now, does that mean this cannot change? I don't think it means that cannot change. I hope it'll, it'll change. Uh, but, but this is, I think, still pretty much the situation today, and I think it's, there's no reason not to be honest about that. I think it's the status quo. This is one thing. This, the second point is what we're trying to address here, in our view, is a, a buffall, a social issue as well. And um, when, when we looked at it concretely, uh, we need to provide systems and, 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 and build models which allow local communities to generate incomes and, 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 and livelihoods from those forest resources, which are able to at least compete with the next evil form of alternative land use. In our case, that's usually extensive cattle. And I, we, we think today this is, this is very feasible, but it takes a number of elements. One is, that we need to think about time horizons and equalization of cash flows, that's very essential. And um, we need to ask ourselves whether the, the incentive systems and the red systems we, we create always live up to that. A very concrete example, the systems we see in Guatemala, for example, work the following year, way. You have a 15-year compromise. The first five years, you get an annual payment. The next 10 years, you have a conservation obligation where you don't receive any income anymore. We think that's not a very smart system to go about it because it creates a lot of stress and a lot of temptation uh, that deforestation starts happening again and forest de degradation starts happening again. So what we would argue, and that would be my, my second point or my third point after the markets, is that we need more intelligent bridges between these type of public actions and private sector models think about productive models uh, on, based on sustainable timber, and in which way, for example, after a five-year incentive period or maybe a 10-year incentive period, you could transition into something like that where you create much longer-term perspectives. And that would be my, my next point that I think from what we're seeing on the, on the ground, we very often think in project terms, and maybe we, we should start to think as well in, in business terms, in local intermediaries and local actors and their ability to, uh, to, to drive these kind of changes over time, not only in, in, in typical red project terms which have a defined lifetime and create inherent uncertainty what, 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 what happens thereafter. Um, a fourth negative point, and then I'm just going to talk about some positives because I think there's a lot of positive aspects uh, from, from, from Red Plus. Uh, 
my, my last observation on the, on the negative side is that despite all these efforts to build strong public institutions, what we perceive concretely on the ground where the critical action happens in high deforestation context, the public institution continue to be excessively weak and the policy framework which they should be concretely addressing on the ground is, in our view, overly complex, overly detailed, not practical, and, and not really working. And I think we should be honest about that as well. That's, that's what we, it's not true everywhere, I'm generalizing a little bit, but we've, we've been observing that a lot. I think on the positive side, I think um, what, what is very, very helpful is that we have increased emphasis on monitoring and ever better monitoring systems. And I think those monitoring systems, when they work for red, they work for a lot of other things as well. And I think that's, that's a very, very positive outcome. That is one, one element. And the second element, very positive for us, is um, even if we are not a red plus a carbon financed uh, fund, what is extremely helpful for us who measures um, deforestation and carbon stocks in forest as one of its impact metrics that we can today rely on the methodologies established within the red frameworks as a way to do our carbon accounting and measure that. And what we welcome uh, very much as well there is that we see now the emergence of uh, certification processes from on this, which are independent from the carbon certification processes. For example, the, the, the recent innovation of the, uh, the FSC certification to add a carbon component uh, to the forest certification process. So all this, uh, I think, are very positive and very important elements to us. Okay, thanks very much for these really enlightening comments and particular also the, the look at the benefits of the Red Plus process that maybe go beyond just achieving results-based payments, uh, by, by which is, it is often measured. By, but you made the point that actually a lot of things have been happening that have, have helped us moving along and for, towards a better world in many ways that are not just related to this. So, um, thanks a lot. I, I'd like to open now the discussion and uh, give you the chance also to comment. Uh, please, if you can, come to the microphone, give your name, affiliation. And yeah. Uh, may Deck in the bank, in the Sorry. Environment and Energy Group. I'm now a consultant for the same group. Um, my, I, I've been doing some work on, on red, and uh, as an economist, uh, it's obvious that there are a number of inefficiencies related to red. One, one is the red function sort of as a reverse polluted pace principle in some sense. It's, it's not, it, it's a system where one, one rewards uh, the, the agent that in some sense does not pollute instead of, instead of putting a tax on, on pollution. Uh, is, and th this leads to a number of different problems, which ha I think haven't been discussed here, which are really crucial for the efficiency of red. One is this issue of so-called additionality, which means that as you're subsidizing um, the protection of certain forests, you cannot be certain that that the the, the, the funding is, is the actual reason for protection, that the forest could be protected in any case. And uh, the other issue is the issue of so-called leakage, which, which means that as you protect more forest in, in certain areas, you could have more deforestation in other areas as a result of that. And the third issue uh, is the, the durability of red. Um, it's not a system which purchases uh, the, the land. It, in a sense, it rents it for a certain amount of time. And the question then is for how long time is this rented? For how long time is the, the, the land protected um, as a result of the funding? Um, and those issues are all very crucial for the efficiency of red. I was just wondering to, to all of you whether you have some, some sort of notion of, of these issues, whether there has been attempts to, to quantify this effect, which I think are very important because it, it, they, they will tell you how much the red actually contributes to 
to actual forest saving, which hasn't really been discussed much here yet, but I think it's, it's really a crucial issue. Leakage and additionality. I think we take maybe two or three questions and then give it back to the panel. Uh, Andrew, you want to? Let me give you the mic. Uh, thanks to all the presentations. I have a question for Aska and Dasono. You say your name? Oh, the, sorry, Andrew Wardell from C4. Aska, you made several references to some of the distinguishing features of Denmark. One you didn't mention is it's the only country in the world that I know of that has a language where the word for tax is also the same word for sweetheart. <laughs> you also have one of the most sophisticated taxation systems in the world um, in terms of the levels of taxation and consequently the levels of public service. And in the first slide, I saw all these countries that you listed in terms of their relative. One feature that I didn't see in that analysis was, what are the levels of public taxation in any of those countries? And so my question is, how can you compare apples and pears in terms of Denmark with, say, Indonesia or the Democratic Republic of Congo, when in Denmark, I lived in Denmark 15 years, I paid a basic tax rate, direct taxation of 60%, and another 20% of indirect taxation on that. 80% of my income was paid back to the government in some shape or form. Now, I know Dasono, you're lucky enough to have Sri Mulyani back from the World Bank now. And she, before she even came to the World Bank, was trying to get reforms in terms of taxation. So my question is, I haven't heard anyone on the panel raise the issue of what is the potential of domestic public financing to support RED rather than international public financing? Okay, thanks. So domestic funding. Any other comment we could take up while? OK, let's go back then to these two questions. Somebody wants to take it? OK. The sweetheart, Danish sweetheart comment. The Danish sweetheart, yes, indeed. <clears throat> Absolutely correct about the language um, and the taxation. Uh, there might be relevant to add in a short anecdote here. And that is just within the last two years, it's been revealed stepwise in Denmark that uh, a, a two-digit number of billions of taxation kroner was fraud and never ended up in the, uh, in the government drawers. Um, so I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a trust uh, a, a taxation system with very high taxation rates that rely very much on trust and self-reporting. Well, then the Danish case is not one for copying. Um, that said, then... Uh, uh, I did not intend, at least, to compare Denmark with those countries. Uh, I was merely talking on the behavior of uh, donor countries, whereas that slide deck, the first slide, showed recipient side. Um, and as concerns the study, and thereby the factors included and the funding included, or the finance included, in, in the study, it was very early on decided, uh, very... Uh, uh, si simply from a, a, a decision on scope and available finance for the study, that national funding should not be included because that would entail a completely different type of analysis and language capability to go into 41 countries and find out what the flows were and how they went. It's an obvious omission. It would uh, suit the analysis very much to have that in there, but it's not. Um, and I would perhaps refrain from making too many conclusions on that because I just end up saying something stupid because I don't, I don't know about the, uh, the intricacies of that. Uh, but yes, it's very relevant. So basically, I didn't answer any of your questions, but uh, anyhow. I think you, you love your taxes so much you don't want to give them to the government. You want to keep them for, for yourself. Just a, a very quick uh, comment on that. We work in two countries where there's... Uh, public uh, schemes, uh, financing schemes uh, going into forests. One is Costa Rica, which has a very famous case. The other one is Guatemala, a little bit less famous case. Um, both funded uh, through very clear budget allocation, one uh, through the petrol price, the other through a certain percentage of the national budget. Um, what, what's interesting is in, in those countries which maybe naturally have, or should have, 
let's say between 30 and, 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 and 50 something percent of the, of the land mass as forests, that is not enough. It is not even close to, 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 to be enough uh, for the financing. And so I think even, even under those schemes, how do you involve the private sector, be it nationally, I fully agree with you, or internationally, remains a question. I'm going to try to answer Andrew's question. I think the reality is uh, Indonesia is still in that phase of why do I have to give domestic incentive, right? Because this is all about perception. Red Plus is coming from developed country to us. We deserve, we earn that because you ask us not to open our forest and you have to pay. Why am I going to give incentive, you know, from a tax purpose, you know, as, as you sitting in Sri Mulyani's head, I'm in a deficit for my taxes. If I give this incentive more, I'm going to be shortfall more. So I think that's, a, you know, that's also, that's where thing doesn't work in Indonesia. Secondly, is I think, you know, it's just too many promises. Nothing's delivered. I mean, you talk about LOI with Norway, you talk anything about Red Plus the past 10 years. Indonesia is on the forefront of everything, right? From uh, pilot provinces, from FCPF and... Really, nothing has been given to a point where you know to a point where the government said that how can I raise taxes from that revenue that I'm coming? I mean, you know, the reality is if you have private sectors, I mean, things will change eventually if private sectors start making sales. I mean, I can tell you right now from a carbon tax perspective, you know, let's say we start making sales, people in Minister of Finance don't even understand what we're selling. How will they tax or give you incentive what while well, they don't know? But only they will know they will finally know what's going on if we start seeing more sales going on. But that's the reality when the, when, when you're in the, the, the Ministry of Finance, you know, there's so many other things that that they understand now, for example, renewable energy. Because they, they need the energy for Indonesia. They we, we're sort of power, but we need the, we know that coal is dirty, but you know, they they give incentive to renewable energy. So they will give incentive for something that they understand. They understand red, but they think that this is, should be revenue-centered. We should not be giving away this revenue coming in. So not until we start seeing the scale getting bigger, private sector start pushing for initiative, and we get, you know, turn it around. Otherwise, you know, we still a long way to go for, for, for domestic incentive, finance incentive for Indonesia. I can, I can tell you that. I think some countries have been actually realizing, particularly in the context of red, no, red funding, the carbon price was mentioned before, red funding not being able to cover the whole costs of the exercise. And in the context of the discussion of the social benefits, the so-called co-benefits, so some countries have realized that they actually have to make an investment up front by themselves in, into development. And then eventually some red funding may come their way paying it out or doing something better, you know, some more development with it or something like this, but uh, not really expecting the whole, uh, the whole thing to be really from, from funding. And at the end, I mean, all the, all the readiness funding that's, that's not being counted for, which is, not, which is coming from the national coffers, is actually also, in a way, national or domestic funding. Do you want to say something? There was also the question about leakage and permanence, maybe. Um, before going to your, I remember two points. Um, just a couple of quick reactions on that question. One is that you're completely right. Um, domestic funding, uh, uh, in our estimation, is, is much more important than, than what is coming from abroad. Whatever gains Mexico uh, has done in the last... Uh, Five years, that actually has been Mexican money. But by a long shot, um, the same, I would say, even in Panama, where I come from, uh, Panama has been invested its, its own money, investing its own money. So on and so forth. I, I think that the numbers are, are clear. On the question of why a country would pay from domestic sources for Red Plus, I would also urge you a bit of caution just to restrict this analysis 
to you know, the cost-benefit domain. There are a number of decisions that are made in society that are not strictly based on a cost-benefit analysis. A country may decide to abolish uh, child labor, okay, or child slavery, not because uh, uh, the net present value of this measure is, is positive, okay, but because there is a social agreement that that's something we don't want to see. I believe that to some extent, sustainability, environmental protection has to go a long way. But go and uh, think about the number of things that uh, your government is paying for, and you will find that uh, not all of them could be justified solely on a cost-benefit analysis. Um, in regards to, to leakage, there has been a, a very uh, 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 widespread concern of Red Plus. Um, in my view, I believe that uh, uh, approaching Red from a jurisdictional perspective goes a long way to address this problem. True leakage could happen between different uh, countries, but our estimation is that uh, that is still, I mean, we don't see many instances in which we could see, oh uh, yeah, uh, deforestation that, that was not, that now is not happening in, in Ecuador has moved uh, to Peru. Uh, at least not on a one-to-one. -one. Um, and I have to admit that the other two points I have just forgotten. So if you could repeat them. Additionally, this is not something that only affects a, a Red Plus. Um, and if not, go and ask our friends at the Clean Development Mechanism, and, uh, and they will give you a talk about it. Um, I think that additionality, to some extent, and I believe almost to its whole extent, has been um, addressed by the way you uh, define your, your baseline um, scenario and, uh, and buffers that you set aside for unexpected uh, 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 events. Eli, I I don't really want to go into that in too much detail. I mean, John, it's nice to see you, but I mean, some of these questions we've been grappling with, I think the land use sector has suffered more disproportionately than other sectors in having to set the bar so high that we become unable to pay for results sooner. Um, so I would really hope that as an international community, we don't go down that road, to be honest. It's not meant to be that we're just going to throw good money after bad. It's meant to be let's set the bar at a reasonable height and not expect the land use sector to have to be the gold, platinum, and everything else in terms of what you can do because the more we wait, the more deforestation is happening, and I worry about that equally. So I think a nice balance there is sought. I, I mean, so many things have been said that I would love to comment on. I mean... Just in our day-to-day -day jobs, what we grapple with is amazing. So when I hear institutions aren't very strong, when I started in this field, we were talking to a one-person show. And now you've got a unit that's dealing with this. So it's relative. And I don't give up. I am totally an optimist in this space. I think uh, we just don't have any other option, right? I mean, when you think about what's happening in terms of environmental degradation, what we're living with in terms of the surrounds, I mean, just it's driving us to think more about how we do the sustainable piece of development. And I'm very much for that. Um, Dasano, you mentioned, you know, why can't we make, I mean, and this again comes back to that bar, why can't we make payments sooner? And it's, when we launched these programs in Indonesia 10 years ago, we had civil society lying at the door pretending to be dead bodies. I mean, that's the kind of thing we've had to grapple with. There's been a lot of sensitivity and it's been an emotive issue. And I think we have come a long way. But this is, again, an example of why it has taken the time to reach here. And it has been frustrating. And I know because I know we're all in the same space. But I think this is, again, are we grappling with setting the bar so high that we're not allowed to make a mistake. And I think um, we've talked about that, right? So I think it behoves on us all to really push these barriers, keep going. And there's just, to me, no other option than 
to make it happen. I, I, I totally agree with you, Ellie. I think uh, you know, if I started 10 years ago, I, when I, just, just to give you a, a, a comparison, when I, 10 years ago, there are literally maybe 100 of us trying to do this you know, project developers. And then the NGOs are very skeptical, you know, no red, no, you know, no rights, no rights, all this, you know, things that they put out. But I think, you know, the one that finally survived after 10 years, these are really the serious players in this spiel. And I think, you know, what people start seeing, even the NGO, is actually private sectors can do much more efficient work on the ground, working with communities, giving the benefit. You know, you can MR, you can monitor them, you can, you know, you can basically MRV those things. And I think now we start seeing that the NGO also believe that this, well, they're skeptical 10 years ago because private sector, they're always skeptical in private sector. But now they start seeing there's a hope to it now. I mean, you know, we are one of the, I think I, when I was 10 years ago, there were like 12 project developers. At one point in time, there were 67. But now we only have, have three. You know, Indonesia, like one or two, big one. But I think, uh, you know, we... As a new generation, we, we believe that you have to have transparency, accountability on a system. Yes, the bar is way too high. I mean, I have to say the bar is way too high. I wish we can have lowered the bar a little bit and we can going to have a transformation faster. But because of the high bar, actually what we have right now existing are actually one of the best that you can see that, you know, private sectors become more transparent. They're there to be accountable for what they do and then they can actually work with communities and they put communities as their equal stakeholders. Well, you cannot see that in pulp and paper industry. You don't see that in palm oil industry. You don't see that in coal mining industry. You don't see it in any industry. So this will be actually a transformation that we want to have. I mean, the government start looking at us as a project developers to see, can we replicate what Darsono do in other companies? Because this is what sustainable development is all about, where you put community first, you also put environment, and you also put profit together. So uh, we are in that uh, you know, phase, but we, will, we can only go that far if we don't have the profit making. We, because we are private sectors, we are profit driven. Without that profit, you know, people will look at me and laugh at me and say, look at you. you, you have done this for 10 years. Nothing came out to this. Why would I be the person? I would rather be number two or number three. I don't have to be the pioneer. And then, you know, there'll just be a bar talk. You know, I think that this is a moment where private sectors, public, public, particular public sectors have to start thinking, allocating, you know, this payment result quickly because people, you know, will, 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 will have the red plus fatigueness is it's not going to get fatigue anymore. It's just going to be gone. It's the point where let's just move on. So... Thanks. I think we need to wrap up this session. I think it was very, very interesting. At least for me, uh, I see a lot of insights coming up that uh, that go around, try to go for 70% solutions because it, it, it seems more important than doing something than waiting for the perfect solution that never comes. And I, I also see something emerging along the lines of um, it's complex, but it's worth doing it, and it's hap it's happening, it's moving, and you you're seeing progress. So I think it's uh, very positive. And, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your patience and for being here. It's an afternoon session after lunch. It's always slump hour, but I think there's coffee out there somewhere. And um, I'd like to. Thanks.